Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Hear the good news. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Beloved, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My name is Victor Resendez. I'm one of the pastors here at MDUMC, and I'm glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. Many years ago, I used to work for youth ministry at Chapel with United Methodist Church, and um, it just reminds me, you'll relate to this story. Um, so I was coming out of a, a soccer game during a summer camp, and I had this one particular student that she just loved to run towards me and, and give me a hug. She was a fourth grader. Well, anyways, this one particular day, she runs out. It was time for us to go to lunch, so we were going to meet in the common area, and I'm coming off the field, and she's running towards me. Well, the closer she gets to me, she sees that I'm just sweaty, and I've had quite a game. So she stops in her tracks, and she goes, oh, Mr. Resendez, air hug. So I think for a while, <laughs> we're going to be giving each other a lot of air hugs. So choir, air hug. <laughs> in this series called Long Story Short, we are exploring several of Jesus' parables that he taught during his ministry. The parables have been depicted over the centuries by masters like the painter from the Dutch Golden Age, Rembrandt. For instance, this is his painting on the parable of the hidden treasure painted in 1630. Or the masterpiece from the Italian painter, Domenico Fetti, of the parable of the precious pearl painted in 1620. Here are a few thoughts on the parables. The parables seem to be told in a poetic manner using metaphors. And the parables seem to inspire great artists like the ones mentioned to depict, depict them in such a beautiful and profound way. Why is that? I think the reason the parables are told in such a reflective manner was to create a sense of curiosity to dig deeper into our inner self. Perhaps to remind us that God's word has a sense of wonder, a sense of mystery. Maybe to invite us to contemplate, to feel deeply, to think deeply. I believe that it is in the depth of uh, reflection where we find genuine transformation that generates compassion and love in us. It's where we generally find our true self. Let us pray. Our loving God, we're grateful to you that we are able to gather this morning to hear your word. And as we dig into these parables, provide us with the open demeanor and the open heart to personalize them. That there's a teaching for all of us here in our spiritual walk that there's a teaching of how to identify ourselves in you and in your love. And we thank you that we have this privilege to do so as we listen to your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Author R.T. Franz claims that modern readers are so used to thinking of the parables as helpful illustrative stories that it is hard to grasp the message of this unique way of teaching that the parable does not explain. It evokes, it draws in, if someone's ready to hear, see, or understand it. If parables reveal things hidden from the foundation of the world, then they are evid evidently not simply offered to illustrate a point, nor to be a metaphor easily understood. They are not offered solely to encourage any action or decision. 
They draw the faithful into objects that offer levels of emotional engagement and attraction. They call disciples into the longing for continued transformation. You see, beloved, the parables are not meant to be simple tales or recipes to find all the answers. I believe that the parables are invitations to allow ourselves to seek, seek deeper and to be reflective on what God is trying to teach us. Quite frankly, we as a modern society, in a way, is lacking a reflective spirit nowadays. With our demand for quick results, our demand for instant gratification, and our frigid way of treating everything in our daily walk as a transaction, including treating people as transactions. See, beloved, this hinders us to grow in our faith. It hinders us from deepening our awareness of God's presence in our lives. This creates in us to be self-centered and oblivious to others, including those that are close to us. It makes us simple and surface people rather than authentic and mature Christian believers. In this series of parables found in Matthew 13, Jesus teaches about the kingdom of heaven. In his book, Jesus, a teacher within, Christian teacher and theologian Lawrence Freeman describes the kingdom of heaven like this. The kingdom, of, the kingdom is all or nothing. All because we must give everything. A condition of complete simplicity demanding not less than everything as Julian Norwich said, and nothing because it is the no thing of the self, the non-existence of the isolated autonomous self, in other words, the ego self. We must continuously return to this poverty of spirit and detachment the instant we begin to re reacquire possessions. The kingdom is nothing whenever we are possessed, but what we possess whether the possessions are material things, psychological states, or spiritual experiences. We cannot be a follower of Jesus, he told us, without renouncing all our possessions. The experience of all and the experience of nothing are not as self-contradictory as first appears. Jesus communicates the kingdom in the absolute inclusiveness of his love, his tolerance, compassion, and generosity, but his selfless death also incarnates his teaching on the kingdom. It was fully human love, a fully, a fully human death. Beloved, the first time that we hear any type of teaching in scripture that invites us to consider to leave our possessions behind, it scares us, it kind of stops us in our own tracks to think about that, what does that mean? But from what we're learning is that Jesus was not just talking about physical, material possessions. He was talking about state of mind, attitudes, ways of seeing life, ways of seeing others. So this is beyond just material things. I think it makes sense. It's too simple to just think of material things as possessions. So it seems that we are being invited to a total surrender. Now, that's scary, isn't it? Beloved, this is not easy. But as we deepen our spirituality, as we deepen our faith, we can trust God's holy presence to transform our hearts and our minds. We can fully trust God's provision and gently detach from those possessions that may be controlling our lives. Jesus is inviting us to live fully, surrendering to God's love and to move away from the illusion that we can control our lives and determine our own well-being. Jesus taught parables to both large crowds that followed him and also to his disciples in a private setting. These two particular parables are exclusively for his disciples. Here Jesus is equipping them, taking them to seminary, if you will. Jesus is providing them with knowledge and practice. In the parable of the hidden treasure and the precious pearl we just read, we learn about the inner transformation and the ongoing experience, the kingdom of heaven in our own spiritual walk. 
Sonia Waters from Princeton Theological Seminary writes the following in her commentary of these two parables. These parables do not actually suggest anything has been lost in the exchange of all they have for the desired object. Instead, they suggest the possibility that finding something as beautiful and valuable as the kingdom is an experience that transforms the disciples' worlds. The parable of the treasure represents the transformational object and the parable of the pearl represents the individual's experience of finding the source of his transformation. Beloved, this morning I ask you, do you recall the time that you found this hidden treasure? How long has it been since you've realized that you possess this precious pearl? In some cases, we've been reminded to go back to our first love. Our first love prompts us to be reminded who we belong to. Because life can get us lost sometimes. It's almost as a reminder to go back home. There's always this invitation, no matter where we open the Bible, this invitation of coming home. It is within that realization of holding this treasure, holding this precious pearl, that we are willing and we are open to changing. Otherwise, we get caught up in our own way, caught up in our own autonomia, which comes from self-control, self-rule. See, the disciples had already left their former life and all their possessions to follow Jesus. So what is he teaching them about? Jesus is helping them understand that their experience has been, thus far, following him is a radical experience. You see, beloved, we can relate to this journey. Listen to this and see if you can relate to your own story behind this. The first encounter that the disciples had with Jesus was a highly intense emotional encounter. This caused an inner change. Then they decide to follow Jesus. For us pastors, that's call a vocation. It's an inner calling But that's also your invitation. That's your spiritual walk, an inner calling. Then spending all that time with him, following him, 24 hours, seven days a week, for what scholars say three years about, that they did ministry with him. They learned from Jesus. And I'm pretty sure there was a lot of inner and outer transformation by learning from Jesus. Now, Jesus is taking them to the next level of discipleship with knowledge and practice. We are, or should be, should I say, experiencing the same thing. Our daily walk should be transformational. A couple months ago, I heard a great lecture where the teacher says, if you're still still living by the gospel story that you heard maybe in vacation Bible school or earlier in your journey, It hasn't deepened, it hasn't progressed, it hasn't evolved. And those of you that have just started your spiritual walk, don't lose that enthusiasm that you have right now of finding this treasure, realizing that you're willing to surrender and give yourself away because of this treasure that you found. And those of us that have been walking longer, let's be reminded of that, what that felt like. It's it's, It's our first love calling us back. In verse 44, we are told of the man's reaction in finding the hidden treasure. The finder is ecstatic. What a find. And proceeds to sell everything. Also in verse 5, we see that the jewel merchant immediately sells everything after he finds the precious pearl. Selling everything is a gesture of surrendering. Surrendering in a new way of life. It's obtaining a new way of thinking and looking at life. It's a renewal of the mind. It's a change of direction. Isn't that the message consistent in Scripture? Change direction. Change your mind. 
my undergrad's in psychology, so in psychology, this would be considered a breakthrough. And it is in those breakthroughs where we grow and mature. Contemplative teacher Thomas Keating describes this joy and gesture of surrendering as so. The reign of God is the pearl of great price, or the treasure hidden in the field. The reign of God is the discovery of the divine presence and action within us. The reign of God is joy. If you find the reign of God, you don't need anything else. The key to joy is the presence of God as a growing conviction, as a presence that integrates and penetrates all our activity, transforming every human faculty and capability. In verse 1351, at the end, Jesus asks the disciples the following, Do you understand all this? And the disciples answer, they do. This is a fulfillment of what Jesus says when he turned to the disciples and claimed earlier in the chapter, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. So this morning, beloved, I have the same question for you. Do you understand all this? See, I don't think this is a one-time question. I think this is a continuing question in our relationship with God. Do you understand all this? What would it look like for us to wake up every single morning with that question and seeking and asking? Would it deepen our journey? I think so. Would it deepen our identity in God? I think so. Would it also reassure us because we are very insecure species, that we have an affirmation of his presence in our lives. I think so too. So beloved, I ask you again the same question. Do you understand all of this? I want to encourage you to consider the following during this Lent season. To seek and to be intentional about learning about the kingdom of heaven through these parables. I encourage you to seek knowledge, but also practice. Gently evaluate your possessions, whatever they are, whether they are material, outdated mindsets, self-destructive behaviors, unhealthy attitudes, life-draining stresses. Remain available for an ongoing transformation in both your inner world and your outer world. Detach from whatever is causing you to forget that you once found the hidden treasure and that you already possess the precious pearl. I found a contemporary parable called the wise woman's stone. And it says something like this. It says, a wise woman who was traveling in the mountains found a precious stone in a stream. The next day, she met another traveler who was hungry. And the wise woman opened her bag to share her food. The hungry traveler said the, saw the precious stone and asked the woman to give it to him. She did so uh, without hesitation. The traveler left, rejoicing in his good fortune. He knew the stone was worth enough to give him security for a lifetime. But a few days later, he came back to return the stone to the wise man, to the wise woman. I've been thinking, he said, I know how valuable the stone is, but I give it back in the hope that you can give me something even more precious. Give me what you have within you that enabled you to give me the stone. Beloved, I think life itself is a parable. It consists of metaphors, uncertainties, scenarios in need of discernment and prayer. What is this? All to eventually transform us or to teach us something about ourselves and our relationship with God. Amen.